and welcome to the best kept secret video cast and podcast from Centricity. If you're a B2B service professional, use our five step process to go from the grind of chasing every sale to keeping your pipeline full with prospects knocking on your door to buy from you. We give you the freedom of time and a life outside of your business. Each episode features an executive from a B2B services company sharing their provocative perspective on an opportunity that many of their clients are missing out on. It's how we teach our clients to get executive decision makers to buy without being salesy or spammy. Here's our host, the co-founder and CEO of Centricity, Jay Kingley. I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Centricity. Welcome to another episode of our Best Kept Secret Show, where I'm happy to welcome Todd Feldman, founder and president of The Rocket Factory. The Rocket Factory uses a rigorous process to help companies with up to 2,500 employees properly identify sustainability gaps, roadmap a future direction, and implement their plan. Todd is based in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome to the show, Todd. Hello, Jay. It's great to be with you today, and I look forward to chatting with you here. Todd, I started my career post getting my uh, MBA as a strategic business consultant. And I got to tell you, I loved it. I worked for all these large companies. They bring us in at an executive level and we would help them put together their strategic plan. We looked at all the opportunities and threats on their external environment, figured out where we thought they could position themselves for victory, laid it all out, gave a really nice presentation and said, guys, it's there for you to crush the competition, make your owners happy. That was a great story, Todd. But I always wondered about two things that I saw that we would never talk about. The first thing was sometimes those great plans, they didn't prove to be so smart. You know, it's that old joke that hindsight's twenty twenty. Unfortunately, I hang out with hindsight's cousin called Foresight. Foresight isn't so smart. Sometimes it was just not a particularly good plan, but it would take quite a long time, typically measured in years before you'd ever know. But by then we cashed our check. We had moved on. Now, the second thing that happened, which you might argue was even worse, which is we do all this work, charge all this money, deliver it, and they would literally put it on the bookshelf and get back to business as normal. It's basically just ignored. So what was the point? So my question to you, Todd, is what the heck is going on with strategic planning? And why do we have these issues? Well, it's a great question. And one of the things I'll say to you is, and and I like what you said about foresight. I like to say, let's create some foresight from hindsight. Like, what have we learned in the past to teach us about how we go forward in the future. And, you know, obviously the, uh, the road behind us is littered with broken businesses and failed businesses. And so why does that keep happening? Well, it's just what you described. It's 70% of uh, businesses, their strategic plans fail. And it typically takes 18 to 24 months to even know whether a plan is on track. So, there's got to be a better way. I, have, I like you, have been on both sides. I've been a vendor uh, working in full-time consulting as well as before I did this. And then also uh, on the corporate side, doing enterprise strategy. And, uh, and I've consumed the uh, large consulting firms and I've consumed boutique consulting firms. And what you described of, we call it shelfware, right? It gets put on a shelf. Um, usually feel like the, like we measure the weight of the binder that they give us and it feels like it should be like a million dollar plan. Um, and then it just goes on a shelf. That's just not sustainable any longer. Uh, it doesn't work. Um, and you know, as someone who has both seen it as a consultant and been a part of it as a practitioner, um, it's what, it's what has frustrated me and why I'm doing what I'm doing. So now the cynic might say, Todd. So why bother in the first place? Let's scrap the strategic planning process. Who needs a plan? Just get out there and do it. Is that an approach? 
or do we need a middle ground? Well, it's certainly an approach. Um, the question is, how much is that approach either costing you, or how much are you? You know, I like to look at things in, at the, you know, sort of look at look at outcomes, right? So it's it's revenue and profitability, it's operational experience, it's customer experience, and it's also um, or operational efficiency, customer experience. And it's also socioeconomic sustainability, which is getting to be a very important topic. So it's, it's got to be those four things. And each of those four things are interconnected. You can go ahead and go forward, but I never know what it's costing you. But the bottom line is anybody that's trying to run a business has got a P&L and they're trying to look at like, are we okay? We're bringing in top line, but what are we putting in the bank? Um, and a lot of times without an identification step, it's hard to know where those blind spots are. Um, and that's another one of the things that we're, we're setting out to fix is it's just understanding where the blind spots are so that companies don't go forward blindly and then come two years later to find out it didn't work. And, and I think I, I would point out to folks, and, and I'm going to pick uh, three institutions or industries here, the military, professional sports, and entertainment. The military doesn't engage the enemy on a tactical level without having any kind of a strategy right. in place. If so, we wouldn't be speaking English. No one goes into sports, whether it's uh, football, baseball, hockey, where you say, well, we don't need a manager. We sort of know what we're doing. We don't need a game plan. Let's just go out and play. And you don't see entertainment uh, out there whether it's a theater or film or music, where there's no script, there's no director, there's no rehearsals. So much of what we have been doing and the way we've been doing it isn't working. The alternative of not doing it all makes no sense. So that leads to the question of, so how should we be thinking and doing a, the strategic planning process? There's got to be some rigor. There's got to be some steps involved. Um, the important thing is that they're done in, in a proper order. I'll give you just a quick analogy uh, or a metaphor. I was sitting at home. We just recently moved last summer, and I was putting together some furniture. And I, you know, I laid out the like you're putting together that put it together furniture. And so it's like eh, I don't want to really. I'm not looking at the instruction book. I'm just going to go ahead and put this furniture together. And I'm at the very end, and it happens all the time, right? Jay, am I wrong? The bolt, the damn bolt at the very end is left. And you're like, where the hell is this supposed to go? And then you realize that at the end, at the, you have to go with six steps back to be able to figure out where that bolt went. And that's exactly what's happening in planning and why, while we like to be creative and certainly allow the creative process to flow and have some lack of structure to allow creativity, there's got to be, though, guardrails in place to be creative, to then plan a business and go forward. It's, it's a little bit of a mix of both on sort of how we roll, but there's got to be, there's got to be some rigor, but there's also got to be room for, uh, trial and error, um, for coming up with wild ideas and then starting to pair them back, um, as needed. Um, and that's all, you know, those are all the things that we encourage, uh, those that we, talk to and, and even when I'm out giving talks to people just like this, just you got to have a got to have a structure. And, and let me ask you a, a question about a different dimension and get your take. Uh, historically, planning is that once a year process, right? We do our budget for, you know, in, in the fourth quarter for the next year, uh, part and parcel with doing the budget, of course, is our strategic planning process, which we do the next year. And my question is, is there a need to be much more dynamic in our planning where we look at plans as living and breathing that are constantly being revised and reworked um, as opposed to this static thing that's done once a year? I mean, I, I am reminded uh, every time I watch a football game and one team sort of getting the crap beat out of them in, in the first half, what does everybody say? What are the second half adjustments? You're, you're not sitting there saying, well, I wonder what they're going to do the next season because this clearly isn't working at all now and they're just continuing to do the same thing. There's always this idea of adjustments that the plan, the strategy is living, breathing as opposed to static. What's your take on that? Well, I agree with you 100%. And the 
there's got to be some uh, regular intervals of review, not just a review of the plan, because executing a plan uh, on its surface is easy. You know, it's not easy. But the harder part is really under getting an organization all rowing in the same direction. Um, and so, you know, we all might be sitting there patting our backs and cheering every quarter or every, you know, semi, se- uh, you know, every six months or even every year. But we got a whole team of like a whole crew of employees that are scared, nervous. They got a lot going on in life right now. They've always had a lot going on. We're now just becoming a little more sensitive to what's going on with people. And so there's that component of it. I've always said like, or there's been a well, there's been a well documented statistic around plans failing because of resistance from people. But I say it goes even further than that. It's like, well, why are the people resisting in the first place? Um, it's not just about the change, but what are the reasons why they're having trouble trusting leadership or whatever on going forward? Because, and that's because they're not involved in the process. <laughs> to get to, to answer your question directly, yes, it has to be a regular rhythm of, of checkups, but it's not just the financial checkups. It's the, an organizational checkup. Uh, from start to finish. So, Todd, if we adopted sort of your ideas and went away from this rigid, static, really not of any use uh, to something that's much more dynamic, inclusive, dealing with the issues of the day that we're revisiting on a holistic basis, on a fairly continuous basis. So, if we make that switch, talk about the executive who's going to make that call, how are they benefiting from this change on an emotional basis? When it comes right down to it, it's people's livelihoods. So, you know, that's what I, that's a you know, matter of fact, I'm in the process of writing something about this. It's like, so I, you know, we, we, we relaunched around this whole notion of identifying jamming and innovating. Uh, and it really, literally the real word of innovation is to take invention that's been already done and making it better, not just a have a separate team over here working on a private project. At the end of the day, though, it's people like our lo- all of us, you, me, everybody, those executives, the people at the front line, wherever in the company, there are livelihoods at stake. And I'm a big systems thinker. And so when we think even outside the wall, four walls of a company, and we start to think of our role in society, both corporately, but also as human beings, that starts to then uh, trigger uh, well, if I, I have to keep earning a living and I want to have a productive life. So what are those things that, what are my trade-offs? So I am responsible, if I'm a corporate executive, I am responsible to deliver this plan better <laughs> in a better way because everyone else is counting on me and I'm counting on me and the economy is counting on me. So that's, I think, the emotional piece that's got to get kind of raised this is not our first financial crisis, not our first health crisis. The the thing that COVID has done, though, is it's sealed off all the emergency exits. Like, we can't fix it with money. We can't fix it with more people. We can't fix... Like, there's... So, you know, and if you look at the system, it's broken in multiple parts, not just one part that we can just kind of, like, work ar- around. There, there's even a greater need for better planning now uh, than ever has been before. One of the things that I have observed and learned throughout my years in business is the burden of being a senior executive or of running your own company. And and unless you've been there, I don't think you quite understand this. When you're the employee, you have the burden of yourself and your family. And it's as you said, I got to provide. I've got people that are dependent on me. Well, that senior executive or business owner has that issue personally, but the best ones feel it for every single person under their care. And there's a lot of sleepless nights, right? Particularly when you're in very volatile periods or you're in a a downturn, you feel the pain, not just yours, but and you realize how many people in their families are dependent upon you and your leadership to keep them afloat. And, and keep them healthy. And um, that's why uh, oftentimes they get a little bit faster aging at that uh, at executive <laughs> right, level. Yeah. And the, the more confidence you have that you're going in the right direction, I think that burden on that decision maker who's driving this goes way down and that's material. But let's get on to a different benefit. 
which I would say is the benefit to the business. And this is where we start talking about dollars and, and cents and metrics. The approach that you're talking about, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, you talked about 70% failure rate. Uh, do you see any, any evidence of how that might change? Do you see any knock on uh, benefits, which the business itself would experience? I just saw, uh, uh, and I've known this for some time, this, the whole sales and market. Just let's take sales and marketing just for just to keep it narrow for a minute. Harvard Business Review published an article. It just came out in December of 21. And it said it basically pegged the misalignment, the opportunities lost, as well as sales lost, and then pr- productivity issues and things like that. A, a trillion dollar impact uh, in, in companies not having alignment between sales and marketing. And that happens to be one of the first questions I ask, like, where does sales and marketing sit? And are they separate? Do they share metrics? Um, are they compensated the same way? Is marketing driven with a budget or are they driven with a P&L? Um, things like that. Like, are they, is it truly a business driver or is it a expense? <laughs> so, um, and that's, you know, that's, those are just like, that's just one set of questions that answers a whole lot around the company. So there's opportunities in, in, in doing a better job and sort of when we talk about modernizing or transforming, which I'm not really, those are the words that people throw around. They really don't, I mean, no one really understands what it means. It just means we have to, we have to change. I'm big on building sustainability. If I build a sustainable business, if I plan for sustainability, like I want to, in all senses of the word, I want to be here for the long term, but I also want to care for my people, the climate, you know, the planet, you know, all those other things that are, that are just equally important. Then transformation, putting people in the right spot, all these other things, if you're doing your homework and you have research and data, will naturally happen. They're, they become an outcome. They don't become a pro, they're not a project. Um, and so that is the other, that's the other big thing we're focused on is let's talk about what is it to be here in 10 years? And then what are the things you need to do to get there? We talked about a lot of the pieces and parts that get ignored. Um, we're seeing it, it's not, that's not working out for companies that do ignore that. I think the case to change how you do the planning process along the lines that you suggest, both at an individual emotional level and when it comes to dollars and cents, is compelling, which leads to the next question I'm sure our listeners have on their mind is, okay, Todd, you convinced me. So what is it that I need to do to actually make this change? First of all, if it's just internal, you know, you certainly want to look at talk to your executive teams and, and get get feedback from them. And then from there, get feedback from your employees. Ask them what they're uh, going through. Ask them what ideas they have. You have to establish some mechanisms to be able to gather that input from them. And it's not the annual employee survey that you do that with. Um and it may not even be uh, departmental meetings. Uh, there may be brainstorming sessions or facilitated and guided sessions at your, at your company. All of that is done uh, with great care and deliberate activity to get to a, an actionable outcome. The best ideas come from, they bubble up from within. Um, so it's a combination of what are, you, what, are you, what are your teams seeing and, and how do you make that, how do you facilitate those types of activities to occur, uh, brainstorming, design thinking activities, but then also a combination of that. And then how do we marry that up with what we're seeing in our market and where our market is demanding that we go or, or that we're seeing uh, an opportunity that we want? I love it when we have someone like yourself who comes on and challenges the status quo, because that is the only way we are going to move forward with the strategic planning process or really anything that we do is to change in a positive uh, direction. And thank you for pointing out to us on the planning side where we are and where we need to get to. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a bit more about Todd. Wondering how much longer you have to grind and chase after every lead conversation and client? Would you like clients to knock on your door so you no longer have to pitch, follow up, and spam decision makers? Well, Centricity's The Tipping Point program uses a proven five-step process that will help you get in front of the decision makers you need by spending less time on doing all of the things you hate. It's not cold calling, cold email, 
cold outreach on LinkedIn or any other social media platform, or spending money on ads, but it has a 35 times higher ROI than any of those things, leveraging your expertise and insights that your prospects and network value. The best part, even though you'll see results in 90 days, you get to work with the Centricity team for an entire year to make sure you have all the pieces in place and working so you can start having freedom of time and a life outside of your business. So email time at centricityb2b.com to schedule an 18 minute call to learn more. Welcome back. We're talking to Todd Feldman of the Rocket Factory. Todd, I'd like to find out a bit more about you. Let me start with what are the pain points that you and the Rocket Factory address for your clients and why do they need you to get rid of the pain? Well, the pain point is that these plans aren't going so well, which we've talked a lot about. Um, the, the areas that we focus, if we're, again, bringing a perspective of thinking as a system, the areas of focus that we like to uh, pay attention to and, and assess before we even do any work are brand. Like, how does, is there clarity around your brand promise? And, and I don't mean mission, vision, and values either. I mean, like, what's the promise you're making to the market? If you have a best friend and you're making a promise, what promise are you keeping? And then is it clear to everybody in the organization that they understand what the promise is, which is, by the way, usually where the people rejection of new stuff and change comes from. If they're not clear on why you're asking them to do something in the first place, but it's brand, then uh, people and culture, process, data, technology. A lot of times technology becomes the first question like, hey, we're going to put in a new CRM system or we got a new piece of enterprise software. Awesome. But what does that do to the people? And why are you doing that? And what does it do for your customers? And how do you monetize the full value of the technology? It is only known unless you do them in order and have technology be that amazing tool to power your organization forward. And then it's the go-to-market piece. So it's the it, a little bit of the sales and marketing and how you go to market and how efficient you are. But all of it, how does it tie back to the broader organization and those pieces? So the pain comes uh, when those things aren't followed and, and taken into account in the proper order. Um, and that is why that is at the root of why plans don't go well. Um, if you read, you can just Google it, um, strategic planning success rates or strategic planning failure rates. If you look that up, um, you'll see a lot of it has to do with like leadership, keeping it to themselves and employees not being involved. And, um, it's not repeatable. We can't measure it. Um, it's the stuff we all know that we do every day in business, but we don't practice it at a, as an enterprise. We do it in our departments. Um, it's got to be all put together. That's where you gain efficiency and, and really overall you gain most profitability. Anytime, whether it be myself or anyone that I know that's a business owner, business executive, and they make that a very important decision to bring in someone from the outside uh, to help them, they always get the question, why? And I can tell you the answer they want to give, which is because, in your case, uh, Todd and the Rocket Factory are the best at what they do. I mean, who wants to work with average? Want to work with the best. So in light of that, Todd, let me ask you, what is it that makes you great at what you do? First of all, I'm highly collaborative. Um, I want to listen and hear what people have to say and where they've uh, had issues or trouble. I mean, like a doctor uh, diagnosing a problem. Um, the benefit is I've done this for 30 years. Uh, started, you know, doing online and digital back in 1996. I used to say that it made me sound cool, and now it just makes me sound old. Um, but I've been like I sold my first. I, I did some stuff with the Philadelphia Eagles uh, when I lived in Philadelphia and with AOL, when I worked for AOL Local. And the first jersey I sold was in 1997. Um, and so I've seen a lot of shiny objects come and go, and I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, fads, trends. And, you know, I look, here's the, at the end of the day, it's about business and we got to make money and we got to do it right. We got to please our customers. And, and we have responsibility to our employees. That's really what it all boils down to. And that is really at the, uh, the core of what we do, what I am looking to do. Um, and I talked about livelihoods before 
just that is, you know, that is actually what gets me out of bed every morning is making sure that I can help people, um, help, help their people have solid livelihoods. I encourage our listeners to go to LinkedIn and type, uh, type in Todd's name, find him and, uh, take a look at his education. Take a look at what he's accomplished professionally. I am sure you will be as impressed as I was, but that's not really my question. My question for you, Todd, is this. What's happened in your life? You know, it could be personal, could be professional, that would tell us why you do what you do. First of all, I mentioned I've been doing this for quite a while in different corporate roles, different enterprise roles, and you know, running marketing departments and doing enterprise strategy. And um, the last place I worked, I, you know, I was the CMO. Um, I saw opportunity where we're making investments in marketing and we're trying to be, we are being uh, an ROI driven marketing department, but it was a financial services firm. And so uh, very conservative, uh, a lot of wanting uh, folks to stay in their lane, including me as the chief marketing officer, I'm making like, how do we, if we're driving, uh, if we're driving leads to the business, in this case, it's loan applications, and we're getting them approved, quality is good. So why aren't they dispersing, which we can't put the loan on the books until they disperse. That wasn't a, that was a conversation I was trying to have where can we tie this all together? Um, that's efficiency. It's like, oh, well, or if we're having like a productivity concern or a, a, a productivity concern, where the loans get dispersed, then maybe I should throttle my marketing. Or if loans are, uh, um, we're not getting high uh, acceptance rates for uh, loan applications, that's quality. That's on me. So anyway, long story short is um, I was asked to resign my last position because of this. And it's interesting because in every place that I have been, I've been, cha- like I've been asked to challenge the status quo. Um, so I thrive really well in challenging the status quo and got to the point there where I no longer fit. And it was clear. Um, and we all, and we, and we all agreed it was time to go. So, um, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I want to just try, I'm trying to help those that want to be helped. Um, and, uh, and there are a lot of people that want to be helped, but yet there's that 70% rate that I keep coming back to. So it's not being done right. So, um, and it takes two years to figure it out. So that's really um, what's been getting me get me out of bed every morning and people's livelihoods. I know I said that already. Challenging the status quo yes. is at the heart of the best kept secret show that we're uh, taping right now. So I am sure that you have done that for many of our listeners, and I am confident they're going to want to reach out and continue the conversation with you, Todd, how best for them to get in touch? I mean, the best way would be email. Uh, you can email me at Todd at GoRocketFactory.com. Now, Todd, you, as I've said uh, repeatedly throughout the show, I really think you've challenged the status quo around planning. You've given us a, a much more system sustainability way to look at it. And, and I know that uh, for most shows out there, they would be so thrilled that, wow, you like fabulous guest. Yet, you know, I'm sitting here saying, hmm, I'm thinking, can you do better? Maybe there's something more that we can wring out of you that would benefit our listeners. So, Todd, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to do so anyway. How about a little gift for all the people that are listening in, taking notes, and having to spend all that mental energy to think about what it is that you're telling them they need to do to shake up the status quo. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think, uh, so first of all, I guess on the website, we have our blog. And on the blog is an article that talks about our five steps to go to market uh, and do strategic planning. So it's out there. You can go look at GoRocketFactory.com. But as part of that, and we've done this before, and I would do it for your listeners if there was enough interest, um, we can do an, a, like a, a mini, call it a mini workshop around those five uh, those five steps, and I can take folks through over do an online session, do an online workshop, and we'll do it for free. So 
And that way, everybody gets some value out of it. And maybe they see where the gaps are in their own organization. They can take that information back and do it themselves. We need what I'm going to call a posse (laughs) of you listeners. I want you to email Todd. Tell Todd you were listening to him on the Best Kept Secret show. And you want to take him up on the offer of this workshop. I can't imagine something that would be so valuable as that. So, Todd, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on our show. To our audience, let's continue to crush it out there. Until next time. 